right, we're continuing our study on leadership. I appreciate Larry teaching the class while I was out of pocket last week. I heard good comments about that study, and we're glad he took that and directed that study, and we're going to continue tonight talking about getting the work done. Remind you each time, and I think we think it's helpful to remind us each time what our goals are in this study and what our purpose behind this study is. Quite often a study like this, we get excited at the beginning and then toward the middle or toward the end of the study, we kind of lose uh, sight of what we're trying to accomplish. And so our goal is to try to develop leaders for the future, both in the immediate future and in the distant future, and also prepare all the rest of us, particularly wives whose husbands may be leaders in the future, and also prepare the rest of us for here's what leaders will be involved in, here's what they do but also is going to help us to do the next task, and that is at the end of this, at the first of the year, approximately around the first of the year, we're going to ask you to submit names of potential leaders, potential elders, who might be qualified in the next one to three years, three to five years in those periods. And so this kind of study will be helpful to you to look at that and suggest this brother could be in, in the next three to five years, but he needs to work on X, Y, Z. And so that's what this study is about, helping us to see that. So we're ready for lesson number nine, getting the work done. These two lessons, nine and 10, will deal with getting the work done. We've talked about plans and visions and, and answers. We've talked about dealing with problems. And here we're talking about getting to the task of getting the work done. So that's what we're going to focus on. Now, leaders must be men of action. By that we simply mean there's more than planning and discussing. Leaders must plan, they must discuss, they must lay out what the future they think would be. They have visions, they should have visions, and lay out plans, this is what we want to accomplish. But there must be far more than that in the work of those who are leaders. Nothing is accomplished at all until the visions and the plans and the answers are carried out. They have to be implemented. Several years ago, I went to talk to a church about move, possibly moving there many years ago now, um, and one of the things that impressed me about the elders, they seemed to be very good men, they seemed to be knowledgeable men, they seemed to be men who were solid doctrinally, but I got the impression with the time that I spent with them that they needed to be led. They, there wasn't a, a leader among them, meaning by that, that I felt like if I were to go there, that I might be involved in kind of leading them and saying, y'all need to make this decision, y'all need to make this next decision, y'all need to go in this direction, somebody needs to lead over here and y'all need to go do that. Uh, that's not true leadership. And that's what we're talking about in our study tonight, is leaders must be men of action. Still in, in, our, in our introductory concepts here, I want to suggest to you that all too often, great ideas and plans fail or at least are delayed because leaders do a number of things. They drag their feet. Uh, by dragging their feet, that is, they, they're planning. Maybe they're headed in that direction, but they're quite slow in getting there. And we'll talk a little more about dragging our feet a little bit later in our study. Or maybe we don't set target dates or deadlines. We have plans we want to in the future do X, Y, Z. There is no plan laid out specifically. There's no target date. We're not going to try to accomplish it by a certain date. There's no deadline set. And so it just kind of fizzles and it falls. Uh, maybe they try to do too much themselves without delegating. We're going to talk about the principle of delegating a little bit later. May rec uh, make reference to Acts 6. Or they let the enthusiasm and the excitement fizzle. Sometimes when ideas are thrown out to a congregation, we would like to do X, Y, Z, whatever that may be. There's excitement about that. We're going to have a new class program or we're going to build a new building. There's excitement, but then by the time it's ever implemented, everything's fizzled. The excitement is gone. That happens sometimes. Uh, sometimes uh, leaders don't finish what they start. They start in a direction and then that kind of dies without them carrying that out. And then we're going to talk about being self-motivated a little bit later. This little slide here is so simple, it's almost embarrassing to to present, and yet it, I think it's a powerful point. And that is there are two things required to succeed in any task. One is to get started, and the other one is don't quit. And so whatever it is you're doing, if you're building a house, you gotta get started, 
and don't quit and you'll get it done. You're going to raise a garden, get started, and don't quit and you'll, you'll raise a garden. Uh, whatever your task is, you get started and you don't quit and you get it done. Same thing with leaders. Uh, get started with the task, whatever the task is, the plan, executing the plan, and then don't stop, don't quit. We saw that in Nehemiah. Nehemiah was a leader. He had a plan. He started with the plan. He didn't quit. And in 52 days, he got it finished. Make sense? All right. Here are the four things we're going to look at. Two of those tonight, two of these next week. So the first two are what we're going to focus on tonight. Getting the work done. Leaders need to be prompt. Secondly, leaders need to be self-motivated. And then next time we'll talk about leaders must delegate. And last of all, we'll talk about leaders must be finishers. Quite often we're starters, but we're not finishers. And we need to be starters and finishers as well. Let's talk about leaders need to be prompt. We're going to spend a little time with our text for a little bit. So let's talk about getting on with the task. Whatever our task might be, whatever our responsibility might be, we need to get on with the task. And I want us to look at a phrase that is peculiar to the book of Jeremiah. And I want you to just notice, we'll notice, and we may not notice every one of these, but let's start with Jeremiah chapter 7. And at verse 13, and I'm not sure that I've got all of these references listed here. We, I may have missed some. But what I want you to see is that the prophets were mentioned in the book of Jeremiah. Again, this seems to be peculiar to the book of Jeremiah. You don't find the same phrase, for example, in Amos or in Isaiah, as I recall. But the, the point is, let's get the phrase and then we'll see it compounded and we'll define it. And then we'll compound it with other references. Uh, hip, if I was in Jeremiah instead of Proverbs. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 7 and in verse 13, speaking of the prophets, and now because you've done all these works, says the Lord, and I spoke to you rising up early and speaking, you did not hear, and I called you, but you did not answer. And so the work, let's drop on down to verse 25 of that same context. Since the day that your fathers came out of the land of Egypt until this day, I've sent you all my servants, the prophets, daily rising up early and sending them. I want us to see that in some other references, but let's stop for a moment and go down to the bottom of this slide. And this phrase simply means to speak earnestly. I don't think it always meant that they rose early in the morning versus starting in the middle of the day or starting in the evening if the task was given late in the evening. As much as it suggests that they spoke zealously and earnestly, and thus they would be early because of their eagerness to fulfill the task. Does that make sense? If you're eager to do something, you're going to be early to do it. In other words, if you hear some news that's great news and you want to share it and you're eager to share it, you're early at sharing it. You don't just delay and say, well, I meant to get to that, but I never did. You're going to be early at that, quick as you can to deliver the good news or bad news as the case may be. Well, that was the same thing is true of the prophets. The prophets had an urgent message and they rose early, eagerness to get to the task. Let's compound that. Uh, I think we have time to do some of this. I just want you to see how, many, how often God uh, mentioned this phrase over and over and over. Go to the 11th chapter and in verse 7. I'm not going to intend to read every verse, but again, I mean every word of every verse, but earnestly exhorted your fathers in the day that I brought you out of the land of Egypt and to this day rising early and exhorting saying, obey my voice. Here's the eagerness. That's the idea. Not so much the time of the day. Let's go to the 29th chapter. Let's notice about two more of these. Je uh, Jeremiah 29 and in verse 19. Again, my servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them. God would rise early and send them, I think is part of the phrasing of some of these verses. And then the prophets would rise early in their fulfillment of that message. Let's go to the last one mentioned there, Jeremiah 44. And in verse 4, um, however, I sent you all my prophets, my servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them, saying, oh, do, that, do, uh, do not do this abominable thing that I hate. Well, the ones we skip say essentially the same thing. The prophets rose early and they got to the task. Here's the point. Get on with the task that God has given, whatever that task may be. And so if you in the future are going to be a leader, going to be an elder, then rise early and get to the task. That's how God viewed his servants, the prophets, with the responsibility they had. 
All right, let's look at some passages here, and you help me with this. You can read these for me. And let's talk about this principle. We're still developing the idea of getting on to the task, this idea of being prompt, and that the diligent are those that are blessed. People who are diligent. What does it mean to be diligent? Before we read the first of these, you might be turning while some, uh, you help me define. What does it mean to be diligent? Doing the best you can. All right. Anything else along that line? Helping us to define this. I'm sorry, say again. Dedicated, okay. Yeah, you're diligent, you're dedicated, you're, you're doing the best you can, you're putting some energy, some vitality in that. So as a leader, if you are diligent in being a leader, you're going to put some energy into that. You're going to be prompt. That's the idea. All right, let's look at Proverbs 10, 4, and 5. Somebody have that just take off reading. Yes, sir. Right. Someone read Proverbs 10. See the principle of diligence? Now, it's not talking about leadership per se in any of these verses. That's not our point. Our point is these passages are dealing with the concept of being diligent, whatever your task may be. Uh, you need to be diligent as a father, as a mother, as a teacher, uh, on your task at your job, your occupation. If you're going to be a leader, you must be diligent. Let's go to the 12th division, 24, Proverbs 12. Someone has it, just take off. All right. Yeah, if one wants, and this does deal with leadership, not in the church per se, but if the diligent is the one that leads or rules, but the one that's, that is not diligent is the one that's going to serve. Does that make sense? As it pertains to our subject here, let's go to the 15th division. All right, same principle that we've seen in all these others. Let's go one more time to the 18th division and verse 9. Yeah, if you're slothful in your work, you're, you're a brother to the destroyer. So if you're going to be a leader in the church, or your husband is going to be a leader in the church, and there's a lack of diligence, what's that going to do to the church? going to break it down. It's going to tear it down. It's going to, it's going to crumble from neglect. It's like a house that, that crumbles. So the diligent are those that are blessed. The nature of the work, that is, this is the Lord's work, and we're dealing with souls, suggests there's some urgency. 1 Peter 5, 1 to 4, Peter writes to the elders and tells them what? What's their work? He dealt with this last week. Oversee the flock, to feed the flock, to shepherd the flock of God. So they have a grave responsibility. That suggests there's some urgency based upon the nature of their work. Hebrews 13 verse 17 said elders are to their prime work. The, the, the number one goal they have and their job they have is to watch out for souls. That says that there should be some urgency because of the nature of the work. Um, now, not, not every decision that elders have to make always deal with the nature of someone's soul being in danger. But indirectly, it comes back to that, and we may see more about that a little bit later. And furthermore, there's no reason to wait. We need to be prompt because there's no real reason to wait. And we'll modify that just a little bit later. Still developing the idea of promptness, let's talk about do not procrastinate. Procrastination is not to be confused with need to think the time to, uh, need for time to think things through. Some decisions don't need to be made in haste. What do we mean by that? Or would you agree with it? Number one. Absolutely. There's a difference in knowing what to do, but then not doing that, and then taking time to figure out what we need to do. So no decision needs to be made in haste. Let's look at a couple of passages here that will help us with the idea that there's, there is not a need for, or, or rather that we should try to avoid procrastination when we know what needs to be done, but we just drag our feet. The first is in 2 Corinthians 8, verses 9 and 10, 
What does it say? Somebody give me the gist of what it says. Use part of the quote without reading the whole two verses. Yeah, you plan to do it, now do it. I like the wording of the King James. Now therefore perform the doing of it. You were ready a year ago. In other words, they dragged their feet for a little, about a year. In other words, they made plans. Does this sound familiar? Have you ever known maybe an organization, a church? Maybe it's your place of employment. We made plans a year ago. We just didn't got around to it. They hadn't done it. Now therefore perform the doing of it. Quit procrastinating. What does Ecclesiastes 9 and 10 say? Whatever your hand finds to do, what? Do with all your might. In other words, uh, no need for procrastination, no need for delay. Dragging our feet slows the work down. There's a story told about three men trying to push a cart or get a cart up a hill. Two men in the front were pulling the cart from behind them. And there was a third man at the back of the cart. And they struggled getting it up the hill and like to not made it, but they finally made it to the top of the hill. And one of the guys in the front said, whew, that sure was hard. And the man in the back said, it sure was. If I hadn't have been sitting on the cart holding my feet to the ground, he said it would have rolled backwards. Well, sometimes we drag our feet and it slows the work down. Maybe we drag our feet on spiritual matters, or maybe it's material things that are indirectly related to spiritual matters. Um, and we'll talk more about that here in just a moment. Many times you hear these kinds of statements that suggest that we're really procrastinating or did procrastinate. How many times have we done something and you hear someone say, we should have done this a long time ago? Maybe some change has been made, something we've been talking about, and we should have done this a long time ago. That had to be said probably at Corinth after they finally sent their contribution. We should have done this a year ago. We've been talking about it. We just, we just never got around to that. Or sometimes we waited too long before getting this done. That's one of the most common comments that are made when, when churches get ready to build a building. Is they, they usually are two to three or four years behind. Meaning they should have been planning a little earlier. It took a while to get it built and they're, they're getting real crowded maybe in their building. Or you hear a statement that this should have already been finished. These quotes are interesting to me about procrastination. Even if you're on the right track, you'll get run over. You just sit there. I like that. You might be on the right track, but if you just sit there and you're not doing anything and you're procrastinating, you're liable to get run over. Um, we'll skip the Abraham Lincoln quote. Charles Dickens said, my advice is never do tomorrow what you can do today. Procrastination is a theft of time. And I agree with that. It does still our time. Let's talk about managing our time as leaders. And um, let's deal with some principles here first, and then I'm going to get your input uh, along that line. Let's talk about managing our time. We're going to look at a couple of passages here in a second. So much of the work of leadership is left undone or put off to a later time because we sometimes say, we as the leaders may say, or if you're in a leader, whether it's in church or it's in some other organization, we'll say, we don't have the time. Have you heard that? Hadn't had time to get to that. There's an old saying, if you, you tell me, if you want to get something done, yeah, take, yeah, take it to a busy person. They'll get it done. The person that's not busy doesn't have time. And so we're talking about promptness, being prompt and getting our work done. So let's look at two passages we know, three passages we know well. The first two say the same thing, but I think it's, it's worth repeating what's found there. Let's go to Ephesians 5 and 16. Someone read that when you get there. Redeeming the time. What does it mean to redeem the time? In that, you literally cannot do that. It means to buy back, and you can't buy back lost time. So what does it mean then? Make the most, best use of your time. Make the wisest use of your time. Let's read the other passage, just to emphasize the point. Colossians 4, 5. Someone read that. When you get there, take off. Walking with and toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Making best use of the time. That's the ESV, isn't it? All right. Yeah, make the best use of your time, the English Standard says. Uh, redeem the time, the King James and New King James says. 
All right, we're stewards of our time as well as money. Now, I'm not going to take the time to read Luke 12, but Luke 12 talks about us being stewards. We think of being stewards of our money. We say, well, I want to take care of this money. I've got so much money, I want to make sure I use it properly and wisely. We're just as much stewards of our time as we are money. Would you agree with that? And as leaders, we need to be stewards uh, of our time. So let's, let's talk about this. Let me suggest some things, and then you help me fill in some gaps that are not there. Let's talk about how a leader can manage his time. A leader or leaders together, but what can this you as a leader do if you are in that position? Do to manage your time. Well, one is you can establish priorities and the most needed, most important things come first. For example, here is somebody that needs to be talked about too about their spiritual condition. Then here's something else over here that may have to do with whether or not we're going to support this preacher. That's important, but not as much as this soul that's in danger over here. Does that make sense? So prioritize is one thing. That's not too hard to figure out. Schedule what needs to be done, that is the when and the who. Have you ever been a part of an organization, forget whether it's church, maybe it's church, maybe it was a group going to do something, and you make a decision and nobody is assigned to carry it out, and it, nothing gets done. Have you ever been a part of that? I've been a part of organizations where you make decisions, here's what needs to be done, and you dismiss the meeting, and nobody's been assigned to see that it gets done. But we made a great decision, but nobody's going to carry it out. That happens sometimes. So schedule what needs to be done. Write down plans and reminders. This is our plan, and here is the reminder. I'm going to put it on the calendar. I'm going to put it on my electronic device that's going to remind me of that set deadlines and dates to execute the plan why is that important do what all right it's a goal yeah how many times have you done this forget being a leader just in your own life i need to do xyz and three months later you're still talking about i'm I'm planning on but you don't have a target date where if you scheduled I can't get to it this week or the next week, but the f- next Monday I'm going to put it on my calendar. I'm going to work on that. And when that day comes around, you start on it because that was a goal. Does that make sense? Leaders need to do that. All right, we're going to do X, Y, Z. What is that? Okay. Whatever that is, when are we going to do it? Well, we need to do it before maybe the next trimester starts. Okay, then we need to do it on this date. And so we need to work on We set goals and deadlines. What else can we fill in? That's all the list I've got on that. You tell me, what can a leader do to manage his time? Don't procrastinate. Good thought. Okay. Yeah, some things may need to be delegated. And so now here, you're the person that's been delegated and you carry that out, but the elders are overseeing that. All right, that's good. Honestly, there's priority. You prioritize your life. I mean, there's a lot of things we do that we think, you know, I don't have time for, but if we change these things, then we're able to make better plans and better manage our, managing our time. All right, that's a good point. Good point. Yes, ma'am. All right. All right, yeah. Give, give someone permission to make, hold you accountable. And in an eldership, there, should be a, there will be a plurality if it's scriptural. Um, the other leaders should hold each other accountable. And uh, if you make announcements to the congregation, this is what we're going to do, the congregation ought to be asking questions. I thought we were going to do X, Y, Z. When, when, when are we going to do that? Uh, we hadn't heard any more about that. All right. Anything else? Good point, yes. Do we have everything in place? Something else may need to be done first. Good, good point. 
Absolutely. Let's talk about leaders need to be self-motivated. Leaders need to be self-motivated. Too many leaders lack the self-motivation. Uh, now, what I mean by that, and I, to me, this goes back to the point I made earlier about leaders that need to be led. Uh, some have to be led or prompted. And that is there are leaders sometimes who will, will take a role if you kind of push them and say, you need to lead here. You, you need to take the, take the leadership. That's not self-motivation. This type, and I put in quotations, leaders, more likely to be a yes person to the other leaders. What do we mean by that? Let me ask two questions. What do we mean by that, number one, and what's the danger of that, number two? Goes along with the crowd. Whatever the others are doing, I agree with that. If they go this direction, he goes with them. If they go that direction, he goes there. Danger? Why? Yeah. Absolutely. No one should want to be a leader that's just a yes man. But if you are the person that is the real leader and the others are the yes men, you don't want that either. You want to be checked. You, want, you don't want to be where everybody knows you're the one that's the real leader and everybody else just going along with you means you take all the blame and all the credit and everything else. You don't want that. You don't want that. Not at all. Absolutely. This kind of lead, say again. All right. This kind of leader can easily be manipulated by others. That might be others in the church that I've seen it where that person is manipulated by his wife or his family. In other words, he's whatever they say do, that's what he does. And uh, maybe others in the congregation can pressure him because he's not a true self-motivated leader, but he happens to be in a position of leadership. So he needs to be self-motivated. Um, marks of lack of self-motivation uh, is we don't get to the task until somebody else leads the way. Have you seen that before? Somebody that will take some direction, but somebody else has started that. They don't finish what they start. They put things off. They lack punctuality. They easily forget a task that's supposed to be done. Those are lacks of self-motivation. Now, so let's raise the question, are you self-motivated? Let me ask two or three questions here. As you look toward the future of you being a leader, or you think about somebody you got in mind, that I'm thinking about putting this name forward as a good leader for the future. Are they self-motivated? Can you, let me start right here. Can, can you and or do you lead the way for others? Or are others always leading you? Are you likely to start working out a plan or a solution on your own? I don't mean you're trying to take the lead away from the other elders, but are you likely to come up with some solution on your own or are you going to wait till another leader comes up with a solution and then you jump on board? There's a big difference. Furthermore, do you have a hard time making yourself do things that, you, that are not desirable? And they're going to be, if you don't already know, if you come to the leadership of being an elder, there are going to be many things that are undesirable that you have to do. Do you have a hard time pushing yourself to do those? Does your motivation or interest in something only come when others map out a plan? In other words, somebody else maps out, here's where we need to go, I'll jump on that board and I'll go with you. But until then, I don't have a clue where we're going. On a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being poor, 10 being excellent, 5 being average, I'm not asking for somebody to shout out a number, but where would you fit in that? And you say, well, I think I'm a 5. Well, then be working toward being that 10 because that's what this class is about, helping us make some changes. Well, I want to suggest you can be motivated. I hear people say all the time, I just can't get motivated to do, it may be to start a diet, it may be to get out and mow the grass, it may be to go see somebody that I need to go see to do something, I do some task. And that's not true. You can get motivated. If your life is threatened, you can get motivated real quick. 
If a large sum of money is involved, you can get motivated. I just can't get motivated, you said. $100,000? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, you can get motivated. So here's the question. Can you self-motivate or is somebody else going to have to push you? If you're going to have to be pushed, then I might need to question whether or not I'm a leader. Jared? Need to be pushing, yes. Good point, good point. Let's talk about this last section here, and then we're going to go to our scenario for tonight and get caught up finally. Mainly because I forgot to give Larry something to hand out last week. <laughs> but we're going to get caught up. By default, we're going to get caught up. All right. I want to suggest that we can and we must learn to master self. And what I'm trying to get us to see in this particular lesson tonight is there are a number of Bible principles that may not be talking about a leader in the church per se, but those principles apply to that. Like diligence we talked about earlier, about the prophets rising early. And here, I want us to look at the idea of self-governance or self-control. When we talk about mastering self, we're talking about controlling yourself, governing yourself, motivating yourself, controlling your actions, having power over yourself. And there are a number of passages that talk about that. So let's look at these here. Let's go to Galatians chapter, not Galatians, let's go to 2 Peter chapter 1. This section we often refer to as the what? Eight graces. Yes, the eight Christian graces. Adding to your faith, virtue to virtue, knowledge, knowledge, temperance. Or your translation, as mine may say or does say, self-control. Well, that's interesting. But here's something you continue to add. By the way, that, that applies to every one of us. I'm to be adding that. It's not that I had it. I did add that a long time ago. No, no, no. I'm still adding that, and so are you. Meaning we need to be growing and continuing to grow in self-control. God expects that of you, and so you're at some level. I don't know where you are, and I may have trouble figuring out where I am, but whatever level you're at, there's still room for you to grow, and so keep working on that. That's the point of 2 Peter chapter 1. Galatians 5 is referring to not the fruit of, not the, uh, the uh, works of the flesh, but the fruit of the Spirit. And one of those is, one of those things that's mentioned as fruit, self-control or temperance. And so if you feed upon the Holy Spirit, this is something that comes as a fruit of that, of feeding upon the direction of the Holy Spirit, Part of the fruit of that or the benefit or the outcome of that is there is temperance, self-control. All right? Remember, Felix was told concerning three things that he needed to do. He was told concerning righteousness, self-control, and judgment to come. In other words, before you can even become a Christian, you've got to learn to suppress your will and yield to the will of God. Titus 1, uh, we read that elders are to be those who are self-controlled. And then we see in 1 Corinthians 9, Paul talks about bringing his body into subjection. All right. So we are to be people who have self-control. Now, how does that fit with what we're talking about? Being self-motivated. Or do those principles, maybe, maybe I need to ask that, do these principles of these passages have any direct bearing or indirect bearing on a leader who needs to be self-motivated? Good point. I think sometimes we, we look at self-control from the standpoint here is something I don't need to do, I don't need to curse, so I abstain from doing that. I don't need to lie, so I am, I'm going to abstain from that. I can make myself not do those, those terrible things. But self-control also means, just as Melissa said, making yourself do what you know you need to do. And that's self-motivation. Does that make sense? You bet, you bet. That is not always fun. 
All right, now with that in mind, we're going to next week talk about, or not, uh, yeah, next week, uh, which will be the sixth. We're going to talk about leaders must delegate, and we'll talk about leaders need to be finishers. This is still part of getting the work done. Let's go to our scenario for tonight, and um, this will catch us up. Uh, we've been lagging a week behind. That's okay. So here's the scenario. The scenario is you're one of the elders, and one of the deacons is not doing his job very well. He takes weeks or months to take care of situations the elders have asked him to see about. Some of his regular jobs are not being done at all. How would you handle this? All right. Yeah, if you didn't hear what Diane said, I'll summarize that, which is one of the things I wrote down. You go talk to him and ask him what the problem is. Why has this, because we, we don't have enough information yet, do we? Not based on what we've been told here. And so we want to know what, what is the problem. Is there something you need that, that uh, or do you need some help? Uh, what, what's, what's the delay? Why are these jobs not being done? That's one thing we need to do. Okay. Probably shouldn't have been that long. Probably in this case always been that way. <laughs> All right, yeah. So she said somebody probably made a mistake. Uh, talking about those that appointed him as a deacon. Valid point, valid point. All right, good point. He may not be aware. He should be, but he may not be. Yeah. All right, that's, that's a good question. Have the elders been clear on what his task is? Um, maybe he didn't know what his task was. Maybe they didn't set a deadline. Yeah. For him, he doesn't think you know, taking six weeks to do something is taking too long. But have they given him, this is your task, and our expectation is this will be done by this time? Because different people have different ideas of what a long time to put, you know, get something done. All right. So, say again? Set some deadlines. We need this fixed. We need this done. We need this accomplished. This put together by, here's the date. That's a good point. Yeah. Ask for a progress report. After all, you're one of the elders now, so that means we, who are elders, could have every right to ask, how's it going? Or ask, why has it not been done? Is there not necessarily an accusative manner? We might reach that point, but it might need to be asked, what's, what's, what's the holdup here? Yeah. How do you think it's looking? All right. What else? All right. Could be. Right, yeah. If, he, if the deacon understands the reason behind why these tasks are being assigned, now he is part of that process and having that motivation as to why this needs to be done. Good point, good point. Yeah. For example, um, 
you know, did, like in Acts 6, where one or seven men were appointed to see to these widows, if the widows, part of the widows, half the widows didn't get their, their food, time to ask some questions. JP? Absolutely. Good, good point, good point. Um, one of the things I've listed here along the line with what JP just said is I might go first of all to the other elders and ask if they know why the work's not being done. They may have some information that I don't have. Here, I'm one of the leaders. I may come to you and ask you, do you know why these, this work hasn't been done? Because they may say, yeah, I talked to him the other day. That may be the end of the story. And um, I might find out what's going on. I might ask him, as Jared mentioned a moment ago, how things are progressing. Um, but it may come to a point that we have to have a straight talk and say the job's not being done and, and we'd like to know why. Not in an accusatory nature, but the, the widows didn't get their food. We'd like to know why they didn't. Because you were appointed to see, the, to see to that. Why did that not happen? And can, can we help you with that? Can, can we work along that line? So we might start looking for some solutions. In the last couple of minutes, let me list two or three things here. And I, I want to, as every one of these, we try to drive at a lesson. There's three lessons I want us to get to in a moment. And I think we've got time to do that. That we might ask, if, if he's trying to do too much, we might teach him to delegate himself. I've known of some deacons who tried to take too much on themselves and do everything that needed to be done, where maybe he could solicit some help from some other men, or women, or as the case may be, whatever it is he's got, his job he's got to do, or he may need to hire some things done. For example, the guy who sees to the maintenance of the building, doesn't need to fix every toilet that's leaking, but he needs a phone number of a good plumber. And so he may need to delegate. So we might need to encourage that. We might ask him if he, you know, does he need to swap jobs with another deacon? He may not be cut out for that particular job, and that would be the fault of, of the leaders. Um, but here's the thing I wanted to drive at. Um, three things I want us to learn from this scenario. Here, here's number one. As a leader, you bear responsibility for what others do or fail to do. Would you agree with that? Now, the deacon is assigned to the job, as let's just illustrate it with feeding the widows, seeing that they're taken care of. But you as the leader or an elder or the eldership bear some responsibility when they do the job well and when they fail to do that well. Does that make sense? So a teacher's not doing their job well. You bear some responsibility if that's not going well as a leader. All right, here's the second thing to learn. As a leader, you will have to deal with some uncomfortable matters. That's uncomfortable to go to a deacon who's not doing his job and confront him that, what's going on here? That is not comfortable. Here's a third lesson and we'll be done. As a leader, you need to get all the information you can before you formulate a solution. Maybe he's got some personal problems going on. Maybe there's some family difficulties. I don't mean marital problems. I just mean he may have some, something going on with his family, his extended family, taking up his time. He's just not able to get his work done. Okay, can we help you? So as a leader, you bear responsibility to get all the information you can before you come up with solutions to your problems. Make sense? Our time is gone. We're going to stop right there.